greatest sin in the world. Why would he come? And so we didn't want my opinion. We didn't want anybody else's opinion. We wanted to see what the Word of God said. And we saw in John 3.16 it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but would have everlasting life. And then we learned simply that it was God's will to send Jesus. In John 6.38 then Jesus said it wasn't his will to come, but he came to do the will of the Father. And we continued on then to say that he came because it was God's will. In Hebrews 9, then it taught us that Jesus came to be the sacrifice for us. Amen. He came to pay the price. He came to deal with the sin that was in our lives so that we could receive the gift of salvation, that our sins would be forgiven. In Hebrews 9, it taught us that Jesus died, he was the sacrifice, and then he went up into heaven. The Bible says that he went into the very presence of God and he makes intercession on our behalf. That's so beautiful to think about. So he came, it was the will of God. He came to be the sacrifice for our sins, to pay the price and to return to heaven and make a way that we would have access unto God. And then in Hebrews chapter 2, it also said that he came to destroy the works of the devil. Amen. That's a good place to rejoice that the works of the devil are destroyed this morning. He is not the victor. He is not in control. He's not the one that can wreck and ruin. No, God won the victory. And the rest of that verse goes on to say that he set the captives free. Hallelujah for that. So he came down to, it was the God's will, and he came down to defeat the devil, to save us from our sins, and to take us out of that bondage, and to let us be free. So we understood then why Jesus would leave heaven and come down to earth. But the second question then we said, well, if Jesus came down to do the will of God, if he came down here to fulfill the will of God, what did he actually do? And we know at the crescendo, the ultimate part, is where he dies upon Calvary's cross. He's put into a tomb, and it doesn't stop there. Praise God, he raises from the dead. Amen and he goes back into heaven. So the death, burial, and resurrection, that was the complete winning of it all. But we ask the question, what did Jesus do on earth? What did he do when he walked this earth to demonstrate he wanted to follow the will of God and fulfill the will of God for his life? We looked at a couple of verses. The first was in Luke chapter 19. We told the story of Zacchaeus, and Zacchaeus is up the tree. Jesus comes along and he says, come down, I'm going to your house. The people can't believe, why are you going to his house? Your man's a reprobate. Why are you going to a tax collector? Nobody wants to go to their houses. And yet Jesus then says these important words, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Amen. Jesus' priority, he said, I came to find those that were lost and I came to rescue them. And the Bible, when it talks about lost, it's not speaking about somebody who's way and walking in the forest and there's no GPS and they can't find their way. When the Bible talks about lost, it's talking about the unsaved. Those that if they close their eyes in death today and they don't know Jesus, they'll spend eternity in hell. So Jesus' priority was salvation, people getting born again. The second thing we looked at then was in Mark chapter 2, where it said that there was another uh, tax collector's house And the Pharisees said to him, why why is he sitting in the tax collectors and the sinner's house? Doesn't he know who he's spending time with? And they queried that with the disciples. And the Bible says that Jesus overheard and he answers them. And he says, "The, the well, they don't need a doctor, but those who are sick, they need a doctor. In other words, Jesus was saying, I came to those that are hurting, those that are in need, those that have sickness in their body, those that are oppressed and tormented and need deliverance. I came to rescue them. He came to get the sinner saved and he came to heal the sick. And we ended that part where we said in Luke 4, 18, Jesus stood up in the temple and he read from Isaiah 61 and he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me. We realize that Jesus was anointed, but what was he anointed to do? It continued on to say, to proclaim the good news to the poor, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the recovery of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those that were oppressed. In other words, I came to tell those there is a plan of salvation. I came to tell them if they're in bondage and broken and oppressed and depressed and sickness in their body, tormented in their mind, they don't have to live that any that way anymore. I came to rescue. 
Jesus' goal, Jesus' priority, Jesus' mission was to preach the gospel, get people born again, and it was to lay hands on the sick and to see them recover. That was his goal, his mission, his priority. That's what he did to demonstrate the will of God on the earth. And then we ask the final question. So what then would be our response to what Jesus is doing? What are we supposed to do as a church, not just this church, but every church? What is the body of Christ supposed to do? And what are we as individual Christians in our intimate walk with God? What is our priority supposed to be? And it's the same as Jesus. Reach the lost and heal the sick. Amen? Reach the lost and heal the sick. That's our priority. And we saw that the early church, they got it right. That's what they focused upon. Everywhere they went, the Bible says they preached the gospel and daily the Lord added to the church. And then they dealt with the orphans and the widows, the most vulnerable in society at that time. They dealt with that. And the Bible says that within two years, they changed the whole of Asia Minor because they followed the works that Jesus had done. And our challenge for the body of Christ the challenge for the church and the challenge for us as individuals was to once again begin to think there's nothing wrong with all of the other things that we pursue. All those other things are necessary and we absolutely 100% should do those things. But all of our focus, it should be done to do this, that we get people born again and we get the sick healed. Amen. And if I don't believe that, I'll have to preach that all over again, to heal the sick and see people born again. So I want to continue on with that then this morning, what the Lord has put in my heart. And I want you to turn with me this morning to 2 Timothy and chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Guys, if you can get that up, and we'll go to verse 6. In 2 Timothy, let me give you a bit of context about this chapter before we delve into it. So Paul is writing this letter. And where is Paul? Paul is now in a prison in Rome for the second time. But this time, when he's writing this letter, he knows he's been sentenced to death. He is going to be martyred for the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's going to be martyred and killed for what he's believed in, for what he stood up for, and what, what, how he's lived his life. And so there he is, an old man. I don't know what age he is, but the, he's an older man. And he realizes that his time on earth is short. And he knows what he's done. Isn't it amazing as you get slightly older, and I, I know I'm not old, but I'm getting slightly older, you begin to look back on your life and the things that you've done, and you begin to look forward as well. And we begin to reflect upon the choices that we've made and what our pursuits and goals all are. And Paul is reflecting upon his life and what he's accomplished, but he's also beginning to look at Timothy. Timothy's a young pastor. He's only starting out in the ministry. He's a big church that he has to look after. So this is a letter that's written from a pastor who's been there, done it all, worn the t-shirt, seen life. He's at the end of his life. And these words that he's putting down on paper are instructions to young Timothy of how he should continue. How the mantle is being passed to him. And he's given us a, a Timothy advice. This is actually a really personal letter between Paul and Timothy. And we are privileged to see what it says here because it's the same words that we can take to our lives. And so in a prison cell, the Bible says, with his eyes growing dim and he thinks that life is over, he puts pen to paper inspired by the Holy Ghost and he writes to Timothy and he says that the mantle is being passed to you and these are things that I need you to know. And that's the backdrop of where we have this morning. So 2 Timothy, in chapter 4 and verse 6, this Paul writing, he says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. And I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is led up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. There you can see it in verse 6. He says, the time of my departure, it's come. I'm gone. It's over. And he's not, he's not complaining. He's not fretting. He just says, the time's up. 
I've done it. I've run the race. I've done what I've been asked to do, and my time is up. And there's a prize for me that I'm going to heaven. I'll get the crown of righteousness. The Lord will reward me for everything that I've done. And yet he puts pen to paper to summarize his life. Man alive, Apostle Paul, he's met on the road to Damascus. God speaks to him in an audible voice. He, he writes two-thirds of the New Testament. How is he going to summarize his life? And for me, he summarizes it in verse 7 in three statements I want to look at very quickly this morning. And he says, I fought the good fight, I finished the race, and I kept the faith. We could speak a long time on those this morning, but I just want to, say to mention them in passing. But he says, I fought the good fight. He's telling Timothy, there's a fight to this. This is not a bed of roses. This hasn't got where you're a Christian now and everything's going to go hunky-dory. No, we are in a fight. We're in a fight to push back the devil and his cohorts and everything that he wants to do to stop the, the body of Christ moving forward. He says, but I fought and I fought ferociously, and I fought hard all of my life, but he describes it as a good fight. Why does Paul describe it as a good fight? Because he knows that Jesus already won the victory. It's a good fight knowing that you're going to win. Amen? He says, I still had to turn up every day, and I had to join in, and I had to join the fight. And Timothy, you need to know this, that you too are joining a fight. The enemy will stand and look you in the face. Sickness will look you in the face. Poverty will look you in the face. Torment will come. People will be for you and people will turn against you. There will be things that will work and the things that don't work. It's a fight, but it's a good fight. You will win this fight, but you need to keep fighting. Then he says, I finished the race. In other words, it started when Jesus met me at that road of Damascus. He told me what I needed to do and I finished the race. What I was asked to do, I accomplished. There are many who start the race. It's quite simple to start the race. But there are very few in life who ever finished. And Paul is able to say, not boastfully, but encouraging Timothy, it was tough, but I finished my course. And Timothy, for you, it's going to be tough as well. But you too, watched on me. You can finish your race as well. But I love the next part. And he says, I have kept the faith. I have kept the faith. Notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, I kept my faith. That could have been a good words to write. He could have said, I fought the good fight, I finished the race, and I kept my faith. Because I guarantee you there were times when Paul would have felt like throwing the Bible in the corner and forgetting it. Read the Bible that says, all have forsaken me, they've turned away, I'm only by myself. There must have been times when you're shipwrecked, when you're stoned, when you're beaten up, when you're neglected, to feel like, why am I even doing this? And I could understand if he wrote here in the Bible, I kept my faith. Even in the midst of all of this trouble, I still kept trust in God. And that's good, and we should do that. But that's not what he said. He said, I have kept the faith. In other words, what's he saying? When I met with Jesus, he gave me a revelation of what the gospel is. He entrusted to me the pure and true gospel. And he said, through all of my life, my mission and my objective was to keep the faith to guard what Jesus asked me to do, not to dilute the gospel, not to change the gospel, not to have a different focus, not to pick and choose what we'll believe or say the things that are just nice to say and forget the difficult things. No, he says, whatever Jesus imparted to me, I kept the faith. I guarded the promises that are in the Bible and I didn't turn away from those. I didn't change my philosophy. I didn't try to sugarcoat it. I kept the faith. I guarded the faith. And so he's saying to Timothy, Timothy, you're joining a race. You're joining the fight. You too will finish your race. You too will do what you've been asked to do. But I'm telling you this, Timothy, you need to protect the faith. You need to guard the gospel. You need to guard the true things that Jesus told us to do. Well, Neil, I don't know if you're taking some liberties there. Well, I finished with that. Let's go back to what he said beforehand. And it's still the same chapter and verse 1. So 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. He says, I charge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead 
and by his appearing in his kingdom. Look what he tells them to do. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. He tells Timothy the secret to his ministry. He tells him the secret to being able to fight the good fight, to run the race and to keep the faith. He says, preach the word. And he tells him to preach it in season and out of season. You know, if you were a farmer, we'd understand what that means. In season means things grow, things work. There's a bountiful harvest and it's all going well. Out of season means it's not growing, there's no fruits, it doesn't seem any signs. And he's telling Timothy, whether there's things growing or whether things don't look like they're growing, whether things look like they work or they look like they don't work, keep on preaching the word. Keep saying what the word says. Keep trusting the word. And it says, reprove, rebuke, and exhort. The body of Christ today, it's really, really good at exhorting. And I am 100% for exhorting in church. You get beat down in life. It is good to come into church to have your faith built up. It is good to come into church and be exhorted and be encouraged and have hope put inside your heart. Amen. That's what church has to be. We need to be encouraged. But we preach the whole word. If we need to be challenged, we need to be challenged. If we need to be corrected, we need to be corrected. And he says to Timothy, correct, rebuke, but also encourage. Get the balance right. Preach the word in season and out of season. Why did he tell him that? It says in verse 3, for the time is coming. Those words mean for the time is coming. He's speaking both literally into uh, Timothy's life. There are days in your life, Timothy, in your ministry, you're going to experience what I'm about to say, but it's also prophetically that he's speaking ahead of time to the church that is today. I'm telling you that there's a time to come when people will not endure sound teaching, but they'll have itching ears, and they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and they will turn away from listening to the truth. They'll wander off into myths. Doesn't that sound like our churches today? That we don't want, oh, I'll not go to that church anymore because, man, they're they're too tough and they make me uncomfortable. I'll go somewhere where they tickle my ears. I'll go somewhere where they make me just feel lovely and good and, and, and they just preach a little bit of the gospel. Paul says people will forget the Bible. They don't want to hear it. They don't know what, they don't want to hear what the full Bible says. They just want a nice wee story. They want a three-point sermon. They want to walk out with their ears tickled and feel good about themselves. And they don't want to be challenged in life. And Paul says to him, you've got to preach the word. You can't be dictated by people who just want their ears tickled. You need to go and preach the full word. And it says in verse 5, As for you, always be sober-minded. Endure suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Preach the gospel and fulfill your ministry. And that's why he says, continues on then, I fought that fight. I finished my race. I kept the faith. I didn't let the itchy ears neglect for me. I stood up and I preached what the Bible said. Neil, man, you're being tough this morning. I don't, I don't think we are because I think we believe that in this church. We believe that we should preach the gospel and we should lay hands on the sick. But he's reminding the church that that is the focus and the priority of us as a church and us in our individual lives. Those are our priorities and things that we need to have at the center of everything that we do. So why is he writing to Timothy? If, you know, if Paul's about to go, if Paul's time is up, and if Jesus entrusted him, then it's really critical that Paul selects the next person. Really, it's really key that he gets the right person. So why does he pick Timothy? Well, he lets us know at the beginning of this. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, In verse 3, it says, I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. He's telling Timothy, I constantly pray about you. As I remembered your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. In verse 5, he says, I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother, Lewis, and your mother, Eunice, And now, I am sure, dwells in you as well. See how he describes Timothy? He says, I'm looking for someone with sincere faith. Not looking for someone to make a name, 
not looking for someone to, to all these other different motives that there could be. He says, I'm looking at you, Timothy, and I've seen your heart. And I describe you as someone with sincere faith. And because I've seen that, and I've seen it in your mother, and I've seen it in your grandmother, I'm entrusting you. And we read on then in verse 11. For which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know what I have believed. And I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day which has been entrusted to me. And here now is his words to Timothy in verse 13. Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me, then the faith and love that are in Jesus Christ, by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. See what those words are saying? He says to Timothy, I've seen your sincere faith. I've seen your heart and that you're after God and helping his people. And because of that, I want you to follow my words. I want you to follow the things that I've done, the sound words that stayed true to the gospel. Follow those words. And he says to him, the Holy Spirit is within you. And the Holy Spirit will help you do what? Guard the good deposit that's entrusted in you. What's that good deposit? The good deposit is the true gospel. He says, I ha Jesus had it. He had the true gospel. He gave it to me. I kept the faith. I guarded it. And now, Timothy, I'm passing the baton to you. I'm passing over this true gospel to you, and I want you to guard it. I want you to protect it. I want you to keep the Holy Spirit in your life and make sure that's what you follow. And everywhere you go, preach the true gospel. It seemed to me as if Paul, in this whole letter, was really, really emphasizing that there is a true gospel and that there's a different gospel. There is a gospel that belongs to Jesus, and there's a gospel that doesn't. And you'll not just read this in 2 Timothy. Any book that Paul's accredited to writing, you will find he begins to talk about the true gospel. And I want you to turn with me in Galatians chapter 1 this morning. We'll read a few verses here. Paul's writing to the church in Galatians, so nothing to do with anyone else. He's writing to Galatians, and he says in verse 6, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ, and you're turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you. And look at this. They want to distort the gospel of Christ. Look at the severity here. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. And I'll make sure that we got it. He says, and as I've said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? For if I was still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Our churches today in the body of Christ are too interested in appealing to man and meeting man's needs than to follow what God asked us to do. And Paul is saying here, there is only one gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if the church will follow the true gospel of Jesus Christ, the church will be strong, the church will grow, and we will see healing in our land. But if the church gets distracted and allows people to come in, like he said in Galatians, and to distort the true gospel of Jesus Christ and become man-pleasers rather than God-pleasers, then you will see a very different church. Paul is not trying to condemn the church. He's trying to rescue the church. And I'm not here to condemn believers or to condemn the church. That is the far from my attention. I'm here to rescue us, to make sure us as an individuals and as a church and as a full body of Christ follow the true gospel of Jesus and we see our nation and our world one for him. Amen? That our gospel is not distorted. In verse 12, he writes, sorry, verse 11, continuing. So this gospel that Paul's talking about, he's so passionate about it. He's so passionate, he's willing to die for it. He, he, and he's, he's taking, Timothy, you've got to make sure you continue in this. Where did Paul get this gospel? Is this just Paul's view? Is this Paul's belief? 
Did, did Paul decide, well, this will make me uh, very popular? I've got some nice words that I can say to people. Where did Paul get this gospel? He knew we would probably ask the question. So verse 11 says, For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Simply saying, he says, I didn't read this in a book. I didn't follow some other man and follow his teachings. I sat at the feet of Jesus. I learned from him. And what I, saw, what I heard what Jesus did, when I spend time with him and I get to know his heart, that's what I preach. That's what I spend my time doing. And so in the few minutes that's left to us this morning, I want to take what the Word of God says and show what did Jesus preach? What did Jesus call the gospel? Because Paul says, I ran my race, I ran at everything, and I'm giving it to Timothy, but Timothy, do as I do, follow what Jesus did. If we know what Jesus then did, then we know the blueprint for what we should do in our church and in our Christian lives. So what did he do? So turn with me this morning, we'll read about four verses, and then we're going to be finished this morning. In Luke chapter 4, it's the same part where we read, the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. And Luke chapter 4 and verse 42. And when it was day, Jesus departed, and he went into a desolate place. And the people sought him, and they came to him, and they would have kept him from leaving. But he said to them, I must preach the good news. My Bible says oh, that's the gospel. I must preach the gospel of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. Jesus said, I was sent to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God. Other times the Bible says the gospel of God. Sometimes it says it's the gospel. It's all interchangeable, those different words. It's simply this, I was sent to preach the gospel. Jesus is saying that. He's telling us, I was sent to preach the gospel. And uh, One more verse in Mark chapter 1. I think it's verse 14. Mark chapter 1, verse 14. Now, John was arrested. John the Baptist, he's arrested. He's, he's put in jail. John was arrested. Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in what? The gospel. So Jesus says, everywhere I go, I've got to preach the gospel. And what did he tell people? He says, I've come to preach the gospel to you, and your responsibility is to repent and to believe in this gospel that I'm preaching to you. So what did he then do? In Matthew chapter 4, in verse 23, it's talking about Jesus. And he went throughout all Galilee, and he was teaching in their synagogues, and he proclaimed the gospel of the kingdom, and he healed every disease, every affliction among the people. And so his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, and those afflicted with various diseases and pains, and those oppressed by demons, epileptics, the paralytics, and he healed them. So Jesus says to us, I'm gonna, everywhere I go, I'll preach the gospel. He said to people, when you hear it, repent and believe it. And in Matthew, now it tells you what he was doing. Everywhere he went, he preached the gospel and he healed the sick. And in Matthew chapter 9, I think it's verse 35. Matthew 9, 35. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues, and he proclaimed the gospel of the kingdom and he healed every disease and every affliction. If you read the Gospels, you'll see those two things over and over and over and over again. We said it last week, Jesus' mission, Jesus' priority, Jesus' focus was to seek and to save the lost, or preach the Gospel of salvation, and to heal the sick. And there we saw it in a few verses this morning again. Very simply, everywhere Jesus went, he declared, you need God, you need to be saved, and he healed the sick. I'm getting ready to wind up this morning, but it said, there's many that say, well, Neil, that's just Jesus. 
I mean, Jesus was the Son of God, and he was. And so Jesus came to this earth to preach salvation, absolutely. Jesus came and he did miracles because he is God, absolutely. And the miracles were just done so that people would believe that Jesus was the Son of God. I do believe that the miracles were showing that Jesus is the Son of God. But so Neil, it's different. It was just for Jesus. He, he did the miracles and he healed people and, and it's different for us and it's different for everybody else. It's, it was really just for Jesus and, and that was a nice wee sermon, Neil, but there's nothing that I really need to take away from that. And I'm glad we asked that question this morning because Jesus did all of those things. He went, he preached the gospel and he healed the sick, but Jesus also knew that he was going to return to heaven. He was sent for a reason and for a purpose, but he was returning back to the Father. And so he begins to talk to his disciples. And so our final verse this morning is in Luke chapter 9. In Luke chapter 9 and verse 1. And it's Jesus, and they said, And Jesus, or he called the twelve together, and he gave them power, and he gave them authority over all demons and to cure diseases. Praise God. Jesus takes his disciples aside and he says, he's saying to them, guys, I'm heading back and I'm giving over to you authority. And what's this authority going to enable you to do? I'm giving you authority over the devil, over the demons and over sickness and disease that are killing, stealing and destroying people's lives. I'm giving you that authority. Now, what do I want you to do with that authority? Do I want you to sit in a seat and go, isn't this great that we've got authority? Or is he saying, I want you to sit there and talk about and research this authority and do all these things? Well, verse 2, he tells the disciples what he wants them to do with this authority he's given them. And so we'll read verse 1 again. And he called the twelve together. He gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. Verse 2, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. Amen. What did we see Jesus do? Everywhere he went, he proclaimed the kingdom of God and he healed the sick. When he was about to leave earth, he brings his disciples together and he says, guys, I'm heading and you now have authority. And what do I want you to do? I want you to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. In other words, continue the work that I did. What I started, what you've seen me do, proclaiming the goodness of God and healing the sick, you continue. And the apostles continued with that. Read it through Acts and see what they've done. Paul then picks up the mantle. Paul gets a revelation of what the gospel of Jesus was. And he begins to run with it. And he fights the good fight. And he finishes the race. And he declares, I kept that faith. I didn't distort it. I didn't dilute it. I didn't turn to the left or right. I didn't get distracted. I didn't lose my focus. I kept straight at that, that my priorities and my objectives was to reach the lost and to heal the sick. And then, as we started out this, he said, now, Timothy, you run the race. You fight the battle and you guard the faith. And it didn't stop with Timothy. Read the church history and read through it. It gets passed down from generation to generation to generation. And the message is the same to me. The message is the same to each and every one of us today as a Christian and to us as a body of Christ and to the wider body of Christ. The message has not changed. The baton, the baton, where did that come from? The baton uh, has been passed to us all. And we have to do the same thing. Proclaim the kingdom of God, that people need Jesus, amen? That if they are lost, if they're unsaved, waking up again, me and waking us all up again, that if they are lost, they are going to hell. And it is our responsibility for every person to not just think about our own lives, but to look at people and know if they die today, they're going to hell. And it is our priority to preach the gospel and to stop people going from a lost eternity. Priority number one. And priority number two is when we see someone sick, give sympathy, of course, Help them, but to lay hands on the sick and to see them recover. But church, it is not just enough. I need to choose my words carefully. Please know what I'm saying. 
Priority is to lay hands on the sick and to see them recover. But the Bible also says, faith without works is dead. It's not enough in church to say, I'm going to pray for you, sister. Or, or I'll say we word with you. Or I'll keep you in my prayers. We should do that. We absolutely should do that. Our intercessors do it. We have our prayer lines. Those are 100% right. And we absolutely should do those. Don't miss it, Stanley. But when someone comes and says to us, I'm broken, uh, I'm in torment, uh, I've got sickness in my body, I haven't got food in my cupboard, uh, my car's broken down and I can't get somewhere, they need us to say, I'll pray for your life to turn around. But someone also needs you to put your hand in your pocket and say, there's 20 kid. I, I don't have a lot of money, but there's 20 kid to get some petrol in your car here i've only got three tins of beans in the house i haven't got much in my house either but i tell you what we'll both go on a diet together you have a tin of beans and i'll have a tin of beans and we'll both complain how we're both hungry the, i said it last week that the emperor uh, julian he looked at the early church when rome was declining he looked at the early church and he says the thing that is causing their church to grow is because they have love for the stranger. And I believe that's the heart of the Father. The Bible says that when we were sinners, dead in our trespasses and sins, He loved us and He came and He rescued us. And we as a Christian, first and foremost, and we as a church, that has to be our heart as well. That for every person, our objective is first, do you know Him? Do you have relationship with Him? Because if you don't, the cancer and things are secondary to that. The first thing is that you need Jesus. The secondary thing is, I'm going to pray for your healing. And then the third thing is, I'm going to help you in the midst of your sickness. I'm going to be there. I'm going to do those things. Now, we need wisdom. We can't run after everybody. We can't give everybody money. We can't give everybody all our food. There's wisdom to these things. You have to look after yourself too. But that has to be the heartbeat of the church. And I wholly believe, I'm absolutely convinced because I see it in the Bible, I am convinced that every church will be a growing church. Every church will be a miracle working church. Every church will see the power of God if it refocuses and reprioritizes that the salvation and the helping and the healing of the sick is their mission and their goal. All of the other things, do not misunderstand me again this morning. All the other things that we do are vital and we should do them and we do all of those things. But we do all of those things to help us fulfill the two mandates, reach the lost and heal the sick. Amen. Praise God. I know that's a challenging word this morning. I know that's not a jump from the rafters and let's all high five each other. But I honestly believe in my heart that if we will grab hold of that, then we will be in here. We will see people saved. We will see people uh, healed. And then we will be able to do the cartwheels around church and high five each other and see when those things are happening. So I, how do we close our service this morning? Well, first and foremost, I'm going to pray for our church. I'm going to pray for you if you've got sickness in your body, as we prayed for our pastor already this morning. It's right for us to be healed. It's right for us to not have sickness in our body. We need to be a healthy and healed church so that we too can go out in there and proclaim a testimony to people that I had sickness in my body, but God healed me. So I want you to put your hands on your body wherever you are this morning, wherever your sickness or ailment is, if it's a physical ailment, if it's a mental ailment, if it's in a relationship, whatever it is. If you're doing fantabidocious this morning and you haven't got anything in your body, that's wonderful but i guarantee you know someone so bring them before you so father i just come before you this morning father i thank you for your word this morning lord sometimes we need to be challenged sometimes we need to be awakened so we are challenged this morning awakened this morning to what your word says but lord i first pray this morning for salvation Lord, each and every one of us this morning have loved ones in our family who don't know you as their Lord and Savior. There are even people in this building this morning who do not know you as their Lord and Savior. 
So, Lord, I pray this morning that the Bible says Holy Ghost conviction to fall upon our families this morning, upon our friends, upon those who do not know you as our Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray that you would convict them in the name of Jesus, that they would know that they're going to a lost eternity, that they're dead in their trespasses and sins, and that they need you as their personal Lord and Savior, that you have paid the price for them, that they can have relationship with God. Lord, your word promises each and every one of us, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So we stand on that this morning, believing for household salvation, for our friends to be here. And Lord, I pray that you give each and every one of us the boldness, the ability to go into our workplace, into our schools, into the shopping centers, wherever it be, and just be who we are, our own simple personalities, our own quiet little ways. But whoever we meet, give us the opportunity. Give us the words to say. Give us the opportunity to speak life into people. and Let them know that they need Jesus, that we would continue to do the work of the evangelist. And Lord, now I pray for the congregation this morning. Those that have sickness in their body, I take authority in the name of Jesus. Your word says that you have given us authority over every disease and every sickness. Whatever disease, whatever sickness, physical ailment, mental torment, relationship problems are attacking us this morning, I take authority in the name of Jesus. And I command healing to come into our lives and to our homes in the name of Jesus. We stand victorious because Jesus has paid the price and won the victory for us this morning. There is no weapon that is formed against us can prosper. And every word that is spoken against us, we tear down and condemn it in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that you give us the revelation that we are a believer. And the Bible says, believers lay hands on the sick and the sick shall recover. Give us the courage and the boldness and the knowing that the anointing follows each and every one of us, no matter where we go, that we lay hands on the sick and we see them recover. And Lord, I pray that you would financially bless every person in this church that we would have finances in our banks and in our houses. Not that we would have all greedy, but Lord, that we would be able to meet needs. That when we hear and we see that people are lacking, that Lord, we would be the first to go and to meet the need. That we would be that ministry of help. That we wouldn't turn our back on those who need help, but Lord, that we would be the first to run and be helpers to the strangers. And Lord, I thank you that that's the heart of the Father. That's the love of the church. That's the heartbeat of the Christian. And Lord, we take that word, we put it deep inside our hearts. We don't allow the enemy to steal the word this morning. It goes into our hearts and it produces fruit. Some 30, some 60, and some 100 fold. And Lord, I give you praise, I give you glory, I give you honor, and everyone's directed back to you in Jesus' name, amen. Well, praise God. Stay in fellowship with us for a while this morning. Back then tonight at 6 a.m. Amen.